Coming up on this week's episode of the Ask Women podcast, we have the amazing Bruce Silverman, a storytelling genius in studio with us. And he is going to explain to us why storytelling is so important when interacting with women and how to tell a good story. So keep listening. Kristen Carney, one of your hosts here with Marty Kenris. You guys know us. You love us. We have a... He, it's, our guest just laughed because he doesn't He's believe like, that we could you. be loved this much, but we are. <laughs> believe it. So we have a marketing consultant and advertising like extraordinaire, Bruce yeah. Silverman, mm-hmm. who has been on our show before. Thanks yeah. for coming back, Bruce. Like three years ago. Yeah. I mean, a very long time. I was it, was it really three years? Oh, you are one of our first 30 shows. Yeah, wow. For definitely. sure. Wow. Yeah, but I wanted to bring you back because you spoke very well uh, on the topic of storytelling, which I think is extremely important when it, in the world of dating. And you are the best storyteller that I know. I could listen to you speak for hours. And I wanted you to talk to the people listening today about how to tell stories. Like, how do you structure a story? How do you create a story that expresses who you are as a person to a woman or to other people without sounding arrogant, too braggy, um, and have you come off, come off really well? How do you do it? How do you do it? Um, I wish that I had prepared more. <laughs> <laughs> I told you before. No, I know you you're a pro. Yeah, but who knows? It's, first of all, in advertising, I spent most of my adult life in the advertising business. Um, creating well, do you want to give people a little bit of background on you before? Uh, yeah, I, I, well, you know, buy you was, some time to think about what you, you know, were talking I was, about. Well, you know, I, I started in the advertising business. I'll tell a story. Okay. Um, I was in law school, and uh, I was actually doing pretty well. Uh, I really sort of thought I was going to be a lawyer from when I was in junior high school. I used to see these lawyer shows on television, and yes, sir, no, sir, Your Honor, objection. But you're also Jewish. I'm a Jewish guy from okay, New York. Obviously, I drink you were going to be a lawyer. Cola. I wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> My mother wanted me to be a lawyer because I couldn't stand the sight of blood. So right. I couldn't be a doctor. Right. It's more emotional blood you have to deal with when you're a lawyer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, there you go for it. <laughs> yeah. So was I was in law school. And, um, you know, law school is a hard grind. Uh, they call it the paper chase. And uh, I was going home for spring break. I, I went to law school in Albany, New York. And I was on the Greyhound bus. I'm from Utica. Ah, oh, that's a person. <laughs> cold weather person. Cold, cold, cold. Empty, sad, dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe lovely. Albany, not so much, but Utica, yeah. Well, Albany wasn't such a thrill. Yeah. <laughs> so I was at the Greyhound station in Albany, and I said to myself, I don't want to read a law book on this ride. I just need to do something else. And I came across a book called Confessions of an Advertising Man. It and was it just was, on the. It was just on the seat. It was a used something. book. It was a used book, and I. Oh, at the station. Okay. Yeah, and I. I figured, gee whiz, you know, that really sounds like it'll be sexy. It'll be, you know, it's illicit <laughs> confessions. What are they confessing to? <laughs> and it was half a buck, and I figured, okay, I'll buy that book and I'll read it on the bus. When I got off the bus, I had finished the book. Um, I had this big old heavy suitcase. This is long before people thought to put wheels on luggage. <laughs> right. Right. I lugged it from 8th Avenue and 42nd Street in New York to 5th Avenue and 48th Street, which was a pretty long haul, toting this luggage. Yeah. It was the offices of an agency called Ogilvy & Mather. The book had been written by a guy named David Ogilvy. And I went in there and said, I want a job. And I told the story to wow. the receptionist. Um, I must have told it well. Because the receptionist actually got me an interview with somebody from the personnel department. That's what they used to call human resources. Right. The, and, I, I need to stop you there because it's, that's such a good example. The receptionist bought it. It's like the woman, if you're on a date or you're you know, at a bar, either you'll tell the story and they'll be on your side or they won't be on your side. So you, you got the girl in this instance. Yeah. Uh, I did. You and definitely she was, did. Well, in, in other ways too. I'll get to that oh. at the end. <laughs> hubba, but hubba. Uh, she was cute. And... Um, we, uh, so, you know, she fronted me in. I got to talk to this personnel person. Um, uh, I probably wasn't as consciously trying to be charming with him as I was <laughs> with her. Uh, and he offered me a job in the mailroom for the summer. And it was a, 
minimum wage job is a buck and a quarter an hour. And I took it and I stayed at that agency for the next 13 years. I didn't go back to law school. Um, and when I left that agency, I was executive vice president. I was chief creative officer of what was then the fifth largest agency in the world. Um, in 13 years. That's and amazing. I created some very famous advertising in its time. Um, I had a wonderful time. And I, if I learned anything, it's the power of storytelling and advertising that leads to the best ads. Because we've been telling stories as human beings to each other since we lived in caves. Mm -hmm. So it's an incredible way to introduce yourself and engage people in essence in conversation. Because they'll stop you and ask questions if you tell the story the right way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's, you don't have to be a great writer or anything like that to tell stories about yourself, certainly. But um, in a dating situation, people want to know a little bit about you. Now, I said, I'll go back to that receptionist. She was very cute. <laughs> and, you know, so I, you know, I actually, I just said goodbye when I left, but I showed up back at the agency a few months later for the summer. And I went up there and sure enough, she was still sitting there at a receptionist desk and I said, hi, do you remember me? She said, oh, yes, you're the guy who read the book on the bus. <laughs> now you're here. And I said, yep, and I owe it all to you. Let's have dinner. It's great. And she later told me that she didn't make a practice of dating guys from the office, especially male boys. She, had, she aspired yes. upward. Um, she wanted at least an assistant of account course. executive. Yeah. But what was she liked was how passionate I was about having to do something other than read a law book. <laughs> that it, to her, it said, this guy must be interested in other things. So when I interview people for jobs, and I've hired literally thousands of people over the years, because I've run very big companies, I ask them to tell me their story. You asked me to do that when I met you. I met you, I... I was working um, while I was doing this business, Wing Girl Method, and uh, I also had to have another job because I wasn't legally allowed to be in the country, so I needed to be sponsored by another company. I was sponsored by Molia and this other uh, accountant firm. Sounds like a version of skin cancer. Yeah, it was a, it was a weird company. I could, I could never say the name. I oh, had it's to, a like, bad case of Molia. Yeah, it was horrible. Um, and I, my job was to network with people, so I started creating these events called Young in Business Events, and I had done this for the company that I was working with, um, and I had had this event and you showed up. I think you were friends with whatever his name is. I totally forget what his name is. Was it Henry or the other? Guy? Anyway, you were friends with him. And at that time, I, I had a desire to be in advertising. I did always want to be in advertising when I was younger. And I talked to you about it. And I think you asked me to share my story. And then you gave me your card and you said, call me. And I said, I will. And you like rolled your eyes. And I said, what, you don't think I'm going to call you? And he goes, most people don't call. And I was like, who doesn't call? I remember you saying that to me. And then I called you or emailed you or whatever it was the next day. And then I've been friends with you ever since. It was probably me, me who didn't job. call. I right. think you gave me my car, your card. And then I was like, no, I don't call. And then it was right. negative. Yeah. Thanks. If that, that's where he's getting the example from, mm -hmm. from people other people. Like me. But I remember you would ask me to share my story. Well, it's, I think it's the best way for people to get to know each other. Yeah. Um, well, what if somebody's not interesting? Like you have interesting stories to share. How how do you share stories and story tell if you don't think your life is that interesting? Yeah, but this always. See, I think everybody. Uh, you know, I'm, I may be m too much of an optimist, um, but I have met very few people in my lifetime, and I've met a lot of people um, who I don't think have a story to tell. Um, do you think they? really don't, or they think they don't have a story to tell? Sometimes they think they don't have a story to tell, and it needs to be brought out. Sometimes they do have a story to tell, and they're almost ashamed to tell it. Um, uh, because of what? What were they ashamed of? Well, it's not you know, I, 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 there was, uh, when I worked, again, for Ogilvy and Mather, um, at one point, I was kind of worried. I went from working in the New York office to the London office to the Houston office to the Los Angeles office and then back to the New York office as the big cheese guy. And, but when I was in Houston, I was working late one day. It was probably around 6.30, 7 o'clock. And I was walking towards the door. I was done. And I walked by and I heard a woman crying. Oh, that was also me. 
That was me too. Was it you? I was, <laughs> Always. You used to be. You used to be blonde. At any rate, I was much more fun then. Yeah, and uh, I went up to her and I said, "Are you okay?" And it turns out that that day, that moment, she had decided to leave her husband. Ooh. Uh, and now you know in the, the power you have with your story. Now in this age of uh, you know Me Too and stuff like that, as I look back, um, the fact that I put my arm around her was uh, probably this is why I hate Me Too. This yeah, you know, well you know I mean I I did that, um, and I said w- what's going on, and she told me it, it was interesting. I don't think she had ever thought about this before, but it all sort of came together that day. Um. She was from a little town called Pasadena, Texas, which is down on the Houston Ship Channel. Um, it, uh, the Houston Ship Channel is completely industrial. It's uh, oil refineries and chemical plants and paper mills. It smells. <laughs> you know you're in Pasadena when you get there because it smells and your eyes water. One of the more fascinating things I learned that night about Pasadena is that people who own homes pay no taxes because all of the taxes are paid by the industry. But that gives the industry the right to run the town. Mm -hmm. And so if you grow up in that town and you go to high school, if you're a girl, you're taking home ec and your job is to get married as soon as high school is over to your high school honey and start having babies and clean the house and make dinner and the guy you marry, who is also graduating from high school, he's going to work at one of those plants. And the only people that get out, the boys get out if they're athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, the girls don't get out. I mean, it never occurred to this girl, woman, to even think about going to college. And then she came to work, weirdly, at this ad agency, which was filled with people in their 20s all of whom were living really interesting lives, doing interesting work, making pretty good dough, going to Europe on vacation, doing things like that. And she, this was a whole new world to her, and it opened her world. And she literally said to her husband, who of course sold oil field pipe for a living, I want to go back to school. And he said, why? And then he just said, don't even tell me. Mm-hmm. The answer is no. Well, I got to know a lot about her that night. I, I don't know if I'd ever even talked to her before. She was a secretary in the account management group. She didn't know that she had aspirations. So sometimes stories have to be prompted. Right, she didn't realize that that was even a story. But now the end of her story in, is in some ways pretty terrific. Um, uh, she did indeed leave that husband. She announced at work that she wanted to be more than a secretary. Ogilvy and Mather, the agency, happened to be an incredibly benevolent company. And somebody was thought to do what I think was, as in hindsight, it's kind of crazy. They gave her a Mensa test that appeared in Penthouse magazine. (laughs) I mean, it just happened that way. And so this was this fellow's way of finding out whether or not she really could go to college. Right. She took the Mensa test and got this incredible score. So Ogilvy and Mather sent her to college. She eventually became a okay. uh, senior vice president. Wow. And got married again and had a real life. The fact, I'm sorry, but the fact that Penthouse has a Mensa test right. in their magazine? Well, I, 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 they did. That's hilarious. But, you know, all of these things come down to a very simple thing. I genuinely believe that everybody in their way is interesting. You just have to find out what it is. And sometimes you have to prompt it. When um, It's like because when you live it, to me, it's mundane. You don't really see the, it's like, oh, this is my ordinary everyday life. So they don't see it as a story. They just see it as like this long, drawn out, really boring movie that really never had a plot. But when you come out of it and you have a bigger perspective from someone else, like because she was so in her town that she didn't know that trying to escape it was even a thing. But you see it from the outside yeah, and see it as a story. Yeah, and but when how you... do you continue to have those stories? So like once that story is told from her, like let's, let's say one day you prompt her to get this story out of her and she's like, oh, this is actually very interesting. How does she continue to tell interesting stories just about her stroll to work? Well, 
you know, even even her stroll to work, um, I'm sure, as I as I remember Houston, Texas. What I remember best about Houston was the weather was incredibly horrible, and the city was pretty ugly. Yeah, I almost dropped. I've an, heard. I almost dropped an f bomb on that one. <laughs> Please, you John, can. And, Please. be passionate. Um, and I, I remember I was driving down the street one day shortly after this encounter, and I saw her walking down the street, and. Um, she was walking, so she must have parked much further away from the office, probably because the lots were cheaper than parking in the building we were in. But she was walking with purpose. And I think that that night for her was sort of, or that afternoon and evening, where she had made this decision was sort of an epiphany for her. And I think it changed who she was. And I think she would tell her story differently. Um, If I hadn't encountered that book... And this is a story. What would have my life been? Mm -hmm. Would I have been a good lawyer, a bad lawyer? Um, When I was in law school, I had a roommate whose entire aspiration in life, his name was Henry T. Hetker. I hope he's not listening. (laughs) Because his entire aspiration was to go into the civil service so that there would be no risk in his life. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even imagine not living with risk. But that was his story. And people do have stories. You know, if, if it's a guy meeting a woman for the first time or a woman meeting a guy for the first time, how do they get to know each other? Well, what they're really doing is telling stories. It's a series, might be a series of questions, but they're telling stories. I, I think there are some rules with, with when it yeah. comes to dating. Um, I don't think you should make the story up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think telling the truth is really important. It's so much more interesting, too, the truth. Um, you know, what, what's that old line? The truth shall set you free. Um, the, sh- the truth shall get you sex. Right. That's the new well, Ask Women version. Um, you know, I, I've had periods of singlehood in my life. He's like, yeah, that is a very true <laughs> And I was telling the truth, but I'm... And I mean, I can <laughs> tell some really crazy <laughs> stories about those periods. But, you know, the truth is really important, I think, in relationships. If uh, If you're bullshitting... You know, if you're, you're some guy and you're bullshitting some woman and you're talking about, you know, how terrific your life is and you have a Ferrari and, you know, you make a zillion dollars or you do, you're, you know, you're a surgeon. When it turns out you're driving a 22-year-old Dodge Dart, right. you know, you're going to be found out awfully quickly. So what's the point? Like I had a malpractice suit, took everything away. Like you could just ride on that lie. But I, I had a client once that I was doing a live session with and he we did like a mock scenario and he started telling me this story about him on a motorcycle. And by the end of the story, I was like, have you ever been on a motorcycle? You're not really selling it well. He goes, no, but this is something that I learned at a boot camp. It's a routine that I learned. I'm like, don't do this. This is not, I'm not believing you. It sounds fake. I'm going to find that out afterwards. Like it's not a good thing to to learn. And also they'll usually default to something like motorcycles that girls aren't as interested in, or to us, it's not as romantic as the guy thinks it would be. Well, first of all, you know, at least, you know, what I've learned over the years, it's always better to get the story from the woman, (laughs) you know, because they want it. They want to see if you listen. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys just jabber too much about themselves and, and the reality is it isn't so much talking about yourself. You know, it isn't saying, well, my story is that, you know, I'm six foot two and I have, you know, lustrous, dark hair, <laughs> and all this stuff. Um, you know, I think it's just, you know, something that happened that might be interesting, something, what can you find that is a bonding thing? Um, you know, do you like to travel? Oh, I can tell you, I really, you know, I had the most incredible experience in Vietnam. You know, some people called it a war, but I thought it was travel at the time. There's always ways. I believe there's always ways. You do have to have a little bit of imagination, but I think people like people with imagination. You know, you can't bore people people into dating you. No, definitely not. But so for people right now who maybe see themselves as boring, how can they learn to be more interesting or to finesse their stories? Is there a way for them to practice at home before going on a date? I think detail is really important. There's a difference between boring detail and interesting detail. And I I think I mentioned this actually for the first time a couple weeks ago, but when I was in high school, I didn't have a lot of girlfriends, but I was, there was a group of girls and they were a clique and I wasn't part of their clique, but they liked me. And at lunchtime, a couple days a week or once a week or something, I'd go over and it would be like, they call it story time with Kristen. Because I would go over and I'd tell them a story and I'd make them laugh. 
but it was always a funny story, but it was always true. And I don't know where I even, where all these things were happening, but I know I, as a person, I'm very, very, very fixated on minute minutia details, very Seinfeldian. So I would go into these details that I think to other 15 year old girls wouldn't first appear to them. But that's what I would do is I would talk about this, the guy in line and the, sh- and the shoes that he wore. And I knew because of those shoes that this meant this about him. And then I would kind of build worlds or something, even though I think someone would first think that's boring, it's creating a picture. And that's, I think can help. I think that can help with your imagination. If you lack an imagination, I think you can look at details, talk about details. And then from there, you know, someone might get more interested possibly, but I know that for me, I like just even telling this story, I feel like I was too detailed. No, but that was, that was very helpful. So for example, if there was an exercise, somebody that they could do, if they wanted to work this imagination, creativity muscle, like, let's say they were to buy some flashcards from the dollar store and look at a flashcard. What, what would they do to help pull those details out so that they could expand their brain to be more imaginative? I almost picture, I don't know why what's coming to my mind is like a paint by number thing. So, you know, like if all the numbers in the paint by number thing are one and one corresponds to red, that's going to be just red. So I think if you can visualize a story and and the colors are all different colors and you can't just keep doing red. So you can't just be doing like, I was on a motorcycle and I do this and I, that's your all red. I feel like you need to include all the colors. You need red, blue, green, and that includes the, you know, verbs, adjectives, nouns, like everything. I think you need to practice. Okay. No, that's actually yeah. helpful. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, you know, I'm a branding person. That's basically what I've spent my life doing. Um, and uh, you know, branding, sometimes people define it, they define it very scientifically or they use a lot of words. As far as I'm concerned, it's nothing more than the consumer's idea of a product. You know, it's, and that makes it very complex. When I say Coca-Cola and I say, what color is Coca-Cola? Mm. You're going to say red. Mm. And if I say, what color is Pepsi-Cola? You're going to say blue. blue. Um, but there are other factors, all of which add up to a brand. Well, you know, people, in essence, your personality is your brand, who you are. And I think that people, particularly for dating situations, um, where you're meeting new people, uh, and you're trying to introduce yourself and figure it out, I think everybody should think about what their story is in advance and focus on it. And yes, there is some, maybe some rehearsal, but sometimes it's nothing more than telling a story about a story. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, well, you know I, if I was, God knows, you know, thank goodness I don't have to be dating, I've been married for a long, long time, but... Um, if I was going out tonight with an absolute stranger that I somehow got introduced to or I just maybe met in a bar and I said, hey, I'll call you, let's get together, odds are I would say something like, just for me, this would work, and say, hey, I saw a movie the other day that was nominated for the Academy Award that I think is a piece of crap. Mm-hmm, I love that. <laughs> Instantly <laughs> and, I'm passionate. And, you know, number one, it shows that you know, you're interested in something other than you're talking about yourself, mm-hmm. but also you're finding something out. Because if in that instance, if the woman has no interest in movies, I happen to like movies a lot, that's not someone I likely want to be involved with. Right. Okay? So, you know, by, and if she asked, well, what was the story? I'd say, oh, it's about this guy who's a clothing designer in London in the 1950s, and he's clearly a sociopath. I know what movie you're talking about. Um, the, the sewing one. The Phantom the Thread. The Phantom Thread, yeah. It, it's, <laughs> was it I, good? I think it's awful. Oh, it was bad. I didn't see it. I, you know, it, I mean, it got nominated. Of course. But I think it's awful. Yeah. I think it's flat out stupid. <laughs> really? Actually. Um, I found all of the characters, I found him to be kind of a sociopath, and the lead woman one of the neediest women I've ever seen on film. Ew. And I don't particularly care for needy women. So, you know, if I was to say, and if the woman said to me, what's the story, I could tell the story. But I'd also reveal both pre- uh, prejudices and attributes. You know, I don't like needy women. Right. Um, I don't like, like guys who um, think they have a right to boss people around in in incredibly malevolent ways. 
I also don't like stories that are end up being totally pointless. Right. I will say that there was some very good acting, but acting in pursuit of a bad story and a bad script, in my opinion, is a waste of talent. Right. So all of these things, you can find ways to turn into a story. Um, and also, I think what's good about that is it shows you have an opinion. You're not vanilla. Well, I, I think that stories... Like you have a perspective. I, I think, I think know, it's I, important yeah, to have a perspective. Yeah, I think that stories should have a point. And, um, you know, when I, you know, talk about... Before, before we started this, um, I, I was... We, we were chatting and I was saying about some of my earlier years in the advertising agency business, I always wanted to shoot an ad or a commercial somewhere really exotic or great or someplace I'd never been. I would come up with insane excuses to need to shoot a commercial in London or in Paris or in Rome or in Egypt or someplace like that because this was, this was my thing. I created an entire campaign once that was based on traveling the world. <laughs> um, on so other, you could travel the world. Uh, travel the world and other people's money. And but also, it forces no better way to travel the world. But when you do that, it almost forces you to get creative. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, or more creative than it you. It was creative. I wrote a jingle and I had a guy walking through incredibly interesting places smoking a little cigar. I mean, it's an ad I would kind of regret that I ever did. <laughs> but... Um, you know, we got to go to we got to go to Bangkok for six weeks. Oh, I mean, six weeks in Bangkok. <laughs> six weeks in Bangkok. I will tell you, it was during if you remember the ABBA song, six weeks in. No, um, uh, one night in Bangkok and the world's your oyster. Um, it was that period. Um, we all came back. Yeah, and that's why I went. We all six went. Weeks there. We all went to get prescriptions for penicillin. Yeah, exactly. There's a story. <laughs> <laughs> it is a story. But that's the thing. Like once you do start having experiences, you have more stories to tell. But what I'm hearing from you is that you can create a story around anything. You have to look for the pieces that are interesting. And one thing that you mentioned was that a lot of people tell stories without having a point. So therefore, their story gets lost sometimes. So how do you find that point? Like for right now, when people who are listening are trying to practice telling a story, if either they do it on their own or they do it out with people in public, how do they pick that point first? Like, how do they know in advance what their point is? Well, I, I think, the, you know, most people, if they're telling a story, they're drawing on, hopefully, on their own experience in some way. And, but, you know, there really is a reason to develop this, call it a technique. It is a technique. And the reason is you're trying to give someone else an insight into who you are. Are you funny? Are you dramatic? Are you melodramatic? Are you a bullshit artist? Um, are you interesting? Um, what are you interested in? What things might you share? If, um, you know, if, if a, the woman has said to a guy, um, gosh, do you, do you ever read books? Well, you could find a way to tell a story about a book and how it impacted your life. Some books do, some don't. Like yours, for example. Huge uh, I read impact. A book, I read a book that literally changed my life. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, I've never regretted it. Uh, but it's, you know, there were so many other stories. I mean, I look at my life as a, a very long story. And I've had, a, you know, kind of an interesting life in the advertising business. I have an interesting life personally. I've gotten to live in many places. I've gotten to travel all over the world. Um, not everything has been good. There have been things that really were not good. Bad things But happen. that makes a story interesting. If it was all good, it'd be like bore fast. Yeah. I mean... Um, you need you know, the ups and the downs. Yeah. You know, bad things happen to good people. Uh, you know, I, um, I have an ex-wife who probably thinks I told too many stories. And maybe she heard them too often. Right. Uh, uh, but she married you. But she married me end. and took all my money. Oh. <laughs> but it was a long time ago and yeah. it's okay. I yeah. did perfectly fine. But, and you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is stories aren't going to work for everybody. Not everybody is comfortable doing that. But the, I think the biggest thing is simply... Um, 
it's a form of communication. It's a way to kind of reveal a little bit about who you really are, what really makes you tick, what you really care about. And um, also, um, it can be interesting. It could be funny. You know, not everybody can tell a funny story. Not everybody can tell uh, a dramatic story. Not everybody can tell a story that will make people cry. But it's the easiest way to engage. And um, what's a what's a natural transition into a story? Because it's like you want if you approach a woman, all of a sudden you walk up and you're like, "Hi, here's my story." What's a good way to ease no, into you it? You can't do that. No, absolutely. <laughs> Be like, okay, this guy has something mentally wrong with him. Right. No, no, no. I, you one know, is my story. So I, the transition into the story, I think, is just I, as important I, I as think, the story. Yeah, I don't think the uh, I don't think you can do. I don't think that using a story. Um, right off the bat is an appropriate no. thing to do. Yeah. Because it's a monologue and that's pretty boring. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you guys, you know, you guys have, you know, all made, po- both of you have made points. So I'm not the only one telling a story. You've all, all three, uh, both of you have told stories during this little session. Right. Yeah. Um, so Mine I think it's hilarious. something, <laughs> I think it's something you lead into. Um, and plus the person I think has to care about you before they want to hear your story. Boy, is that true. Yeah. I mean, there's no point. If, as a matter of fact, I think that would probably be the worst possible thing that you could do. Yeah. You know, um, here's my story and I'm sticking to it. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, it's it's got to be, you know, it's a way of getting to know someone, you know, but it's not it's not instant dating. Because I think with like brand stuff, I would guess when you're branding something, you, the person has to kind of even care about the brand to begin with to then be impacted by the message it's sending. Is that, would you say that's right? Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, I, I'll tell you another story, a quick one. How I met my wife. Okay. Uh, so I owned an advertising agency here in Los Angeles and um, we were looking for someone to be in account service. Actually, I'm going to interrupt you for one second. We're going to take a quick break. Oh, we're doing breaks again. Yes, we're doing breaks again. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Before we uh, get to that story. So we'll be back in a second. I wanted to take a second and talk about one of our amazing sponsors. You may or may not have seen these things called RX bars, but I've seen them everywhere. And to be honest, I've tasted every single one of these RX bars because they are fantastic. And lucky for me, they fit into my paleo lifestyle of clean food that don't have artificial ingredients, fillers, preservatives. I hate all that stuff. There's no need to have it. And I was dying to find a wonderful bar that I could take on the go with me that actually fit into my type of diet that I eat. Yes, I'm picky. Yes, I'm annoying. But these things are even more annoying because on the back end, they can kill you if you keep eating them. Anyway, I'm not going to preach about that. But I wanted to tell you about our sponsor, RX Bar, because they are fantastic. Basically, they have nothing in them except for three egg whites, two dates, and six almonds, and then some other type of fruit, depending on what flavor they are, or a chocolate or a coconut. One of my favorite flavors is the salted caramel. They are the perfect mix of savory salty and sweet. They are absolutely amazing and very, very filling. And I think that you guys should go and get them, not because they're sponsoring our show, but because they are absolutely fantastic. They sent us a whole box (laughs) as a sample for our show and I devoured them in about three days. And the whole box has about 12 different bars in them. So that's how good they are uh, and that's how clean they are. And I was really happy to be able to have a snack like the rest of the world. Anyway, I want you to go check out these bars because they're awesome. And for 25% off your first order, this is a very lucky deal that you get, 25% off your first order, visit rxbar.com slash wants and enter your promo code wants at checkout. And that's how you will get 25% off these amazing, amazing bars. I think you will absolutely love them. Again, they are gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, no sugar added, no artificial colors, no artificial flavors, preservatives, or fillers. They're good for breakfast on the go, snack at the office. You throw them in your bag. You take them on the bus with you wherever you need them. For 25% off your first order, visit rx.com slash wants and enter promo code wants at checkout. And these babies are yours. Go check them out. 
Okay, so we're back, and we're <laughs> oh jumping God. right back Magic in. Of the podcast. <laughs> so I owned this ad agency. I was looking for someone to be an account executive on um, two, for two clients, both of which were involved in um, clothing for women. One was a retail chain that sold basically junior sportswear, and one was a manufacturer of jeans, primarily jeans. That's what I work out on. And, yeah, and, um, I believe that actually. and a, a friend of mine... Uh, called and said, I met a woman who might be good for that job you're trying to fill. Um, and this is what he said. She is a tall, leggy, California blonde. <laughs> and I said, I'll interview her. <laughs> of course I will. Of course, I'm not stupid. <laughs> so uh, she called and we made an appointment and she came in. And I yada, did yada, what yada. I always do. I just said, <laughs> okay, so... Um, you're looking for a job in advertising, but I'm looking here at your resume and you've never worked at an advertising agency. And she said, no, she said, I've worked for a long time in the radio business. I sold time and I went, well, this is kind of a different job. She said, I don't think it is. And then she told me how she evolved in the radio business. It wasn't long, but I came away saying, ooh, this woman not only is pretty, but she's really got a brain and she's good at this. And I said, you know, um, you could be really right for this job. How much money do you want? And she wanted exactly twice as much as I had budgeted for the job. <laughs> and I, I mean, I couldn't do that. Um, it would have, you know, really been economically unwise. And I said, God, I said, you know, I didn't know that you could make that much money in the radio business. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, why do you want to leave? And at that point, she told me a story. And I won't go into what her story was. But she told this quick story. Afterwards, I looked at my watch and I said, hey, it's noon. I can't hire you. Let's have lunch. <laughs> um, and we've been together and that's literally. that's time the story has not worked. <laughs> we've been together since that Wow. Lunch. Really? Wow. 25 years. What job did she end up taking? Job. Uh, she actually went back to the radio business. Oh, wow. Um, but she, she had been passed over for a job at the station she was at. And at lunch, I said, so you got passed over. Go get another job where you get the job you want. And she did and ended up, she was the only, I mean, talk about sexism. She was the only female general manager of a radio station in the Los Angeles market which has 72 radio stations. That's crazy. A little bit of a glass ceiling yeah. there, but she broke it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and did very well with that until she walked away from it. But it was the story she told that revealed that she was just not likely to settle for stuff. Um, but she also told it with a certain amount of humor. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, uh, and you know, it was, ooh, I like her. And, you know, she was clearly a brilliant woman because she liked me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, it was those little stories. And she, you know, at lunch, you know, she asked me, you know, you, know, you, you're, you own this agency, you run this agency. You know, how long have you been there? Because she knew almost nothing about me other than what this friend of mine had told her that, it, you know, that I was just a guy who owned an agency. And, you know, I... Talked about, you know, how I'd come up and, you know, these big, huge agencies that I ended up running these big, huge places. And then I built this agency and, you know, someday hope to sell it and all of that. And maybe she just was intrigued. Or, but I, she, we also talked at lunch. I remember this really well, that we had both seen a play in the previous two or three weeks, the same play. And so we discovered we both like theater. And... Um, and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for those common connections yeah. in your conversation. I, I don't believe, you know, I believe that opposites attract, mm. but I don't believe that opposites stay together. Mm. I really don't. Mm -hmm. I think the more you have in common, the more likely you will have to have a good relationship. I agree. That, that oh, I agree lasts. I completely agree with you. This was wonderful. I, I, I want to put an end to the storytelling story portion for now, and we want to answer a few questions from our listeners. Are you open to doing that? Sure. Okay, good. I have some questions. You can do that? There are people listening? Yes, there are. There's four <laughs> of them. Believe it they or not. They all live in Albuquerque. 
And they're awesome people. Okay. Ladies, I'm in my 30s and work in an office environment. There's a woman at work who is married who I would like to recruit and cultivate as a wing girl. She's shown some signs that this is possible, such as mentioning a potential match with one of her pole dance classmates. It didn't end up happening and helping me a little in my search for my apartment instead. These are just a few examples. If this were anybody other than a married coworker, I would interpret her behavior as flirtatious, teasing, ball busting, casual touch, and there was a time or two she twerked for me. But I want to be clear for the purposes of this email that neither of us is trying to hook up with the other. We also have a high degree of professional trust on work issues and office politics. Frankly, I could really use your help. So I want to encourage this wing girlish behavior. How do I do so without seeming desperate, turning her off, or freaking out her husband? Okay, well, Joe. why does he care about turn, turning her off if there's no, it's no, there's no flirting, there's no potential anything? Just ask. Be like, you, you're super fun. Women will make me, or you'll make me look better around women. Be my wing girl. But then how would she approach that to her husband? Like, I'm going out and helping this guy get women. But she could say it that way. And then I'd she, say, like, why don't you come with us? If that's, you know, if you're uncomfortable with it. Um, but yeah, she, you could totally just phrase it that way. I'm, I, I am curious about the looking bad or turning her off as well. I think what he's saying is the fact that he needs help may not help her sell him as well to other women. No. I think that's what his concern is. But I don't from. think you should have that concern. No, I don't think so. Though. What do you think? Oh, gosh. Um, so wing girl, like a wing man. So he's, he yeah. wants to ask this girl to help him. No, I, I, I understand that. Um, Boy, I, I mean, you've you've explained this <laughs> wing girl thing to me over and over, <laughs> I guess I guess over and over, and uh, and I I really get why it would be a good thing. I think it becomes a little problematic when the wing girl is married, um, because I'm not sure how I would have felt if um, my wife came to me and said. <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm going to go yeah. out with this guy. Yeah, to welcome help to him my husband's girls. world. Yeah. He was like, "What are you doing?" He wanted to come with me when I would go out on like the, the yeah. Live. Jordan, her husband, really is a saint. <laughs> she has weekly meetings with him. They have weekly married meetings. Can you imagine? Yeah, we have an agenda. We talk about things. That's how marriage works. That's how you function properly. This is, anyway. this is the opposites. This is how you have to have it work by having weekly meetings. No, I think it's great. Idea. There has to be a lot of trust, and um, definitely, you know. But I, you know, I have. I have some uh, female friends, and Nancy has some male friends. And, you know, I mean, they're friends, uh, but they're not necessarily friends of both of ours. Right. Um, and, were they uh, friends that you guys made after you were together or before? Before. I, yeah, that, yeah, I feel like making new friendships of, after marriage, after marriage is of weird. the opposite sex becomes strange. It is or hard it though when you cause problems in the relationship. Yeah, but when you already had it, it was a cultivated relationship, and then all of a sudden you have to say goodbye. Like that's yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it, it, you know, there's a certain awkwardness to it. Um, I have a, I have a client um, in Pennsylvania, in the middle of Pennsylvania, um, that I have to go to see from time to time. Um, but it's a big client. They spend a lot of money, and uh, and I do a lot of advertising for them. Um, and the uh, woman who is the head of marketing there is a uh, very nice woman. Uh, she's in her early 50s. Her husband, who was 20 years older than her, passed away last year. And um, afterwards, she would call me a lot. Uh, I think she just, I was someone who she was comfortable speaking with. Um, I was supportive. Um, I think she was good at a job, and I liked her as a person. Um, and uh, we were, you know, and I, when I go to Pennsylvania, we end up going out to dinner and stuff like that. Um, but I know that uh, it there's a line you have to draw. Part of it is she's a business colleague. And part of it is I'm a happily married guy. Right. And... Uh, I'm not, sometimes I, I got this feeling that she would sometimes cross the line. I'm not sure she crossed the line. It was sort of a feeling. Yeah. It's too gray of but an area. It was, it was discomforting. But I have, you know, these people who I've known for decades, um, you know, women who I've known for decades um, who, you know, we've been through some stuff together, people I met at work and stuff like that. Um, you know, they're good friends. Um, yeah. And I would do anything to help them out, and I think they would do anything to help me out. 
Um, one of them was, you know, remember when they had that huge storm in Texas this past year in Houston? Yeah. And she lives in Houston, and she literally, she called me from the roof of her house <laughs> waiting for Holy a boat. Holy shit. And she said... She's like, can I come stay with you? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what she did. She, and I said... Uh, yeah, I said, do you need me to get you an airplane ticket? Yeah. And she said, if you could, because everything I own is in the house. Wow. So I arranged for an airplane ticket. She got herself to the airport. She flew out. You know, I'm, you know that's what friends are for. So your wife was okay with, with this? Yeah, and my, my wife didn't know this woman very well. I'm not sure that they had ever met. I mean, I met, I met this woman, good God, more than 40 years ago. Wow. But... Um, there she was on a roof. And I guess maybe I was the one she thought she could call because it was probably dry here in California right. because we don't get enough rain. But I rain. would say, as a woman, there's something that would go through my head thinking, why did she call him? Like, like that I, I would want to understand your relationship to her, that this woman is stranded on a roof and she thinks to call you. Yeah, you know, it would pa- it pass probably, through my head. It probably yeah. didn't. Does she not have family or? It probably didn't hurt that she's gay. Okay. Oh. That, there you go. That's helpful. Okay. Well, you didn't say that part of the story. But if well, you know, a straight the girl, woman, I'd be like, what are you calling? You know, the girl at work, if she wanted to help him be his wing girl, she could phrase it to her husband. I mean, this is lying, but he's gay. I'm going to go help him get men. Oh, no, you can't. No, you, can't. <laughs> you can't lie. I did that once because I, I had started to form a new friendship with a guy who actually I thought was gay. It turns out he wasn't gay, but I had told Jordan that he was gay to make him feel more comfortable. And I remember a woman that I worked with at the time, I had told her that I had said that to Jordan. And then she came back to me three days later saying, I've been up at night thinking about this because it's really bothering me, but you cannot do that. To Jordan, you can't be that distrustful. You have to tell him the truth. Like I know it's easier, and you have no intention of doing anything, but it's that's just a small lie that's going to hurt your relationship. Yeah, and I, you know, I, if I, you're I if you're that. you know strong people, trust you know people that really care about each other and respect each other, then trust goes with that. Yeah, and I, agree. I think. I think if you don't have trust, that relationship is dead. I, agree. I don't think this woman is going to help him every single night, but she can certainly dedicate like a one evening a month or something. Maybe her and her husband could go. Right, exactly. And they could have fun doing it. Okay, one more question, and then we're going to wrap up the show. I've just started listening uh, to your show and enjoy it. I'm sure you have probably covered this many times, but I'm very scared of approaching women. When I was younger, I was sometimes able to do it, but a couple of years ago, I got a ton of rejections on the trot, and it's really knocked my confidence. Ever since then, I just can't seem to approach any girls. Since that big run of rejections a couple of years ago, I now just assume there are no girls out there who will like me. I also worry about looking like a tit, not only in front of the girl, but also probably. in front of her friends and or any nearby people. Even when I sometimes think a girl might be looking or smiling at me, I still can't do it. I am in my 30s now, and I would love to meet somebody longer term. I would love to try daytime approaches. Is that possible? Hope you can help. Well, I think so. The last show that we, we recorded, we were talking about lifestyle and having people within that lifestyle. And I really think that that makes approaching so much easier because, say, you're on a beach volleyball team and it's not like some random woman on the street. It is hard to approach random women yeah. on the street as the approacher and as, a, as the approachee because, you know, you might not want to be approached. I feel like you changed your, I feel like you changed your tune a bit because I think recently you said random women don't really want to be approached. But this whole time we've been on the podcast, you said, approach her. What's there to lose? Because that's the truth. There is nothing to lose. But you have a lower chance when you're approaching if it's just somebody a random. randomly who's walking down the street. It doesn't mean that they're not going to turn around and be like, oh, you're very interesting. Sure, I'll go out for coffee with you. But it's going to take a lot more work and a lot more confidence in you to get to that point with a random person who is, who is on Definitely. a mission to do something. Bruce was shaking his head. I'm shaking my head big time. <laughs> Um, like, do I, not I think, approach people. I think we live in a time when if a guy walks up to a woman cold who is not seeking out meeting somebody, she's just on the street, she's likely to call the cops. I, it's, <laughs> no, Maybe. It's, well, you know, that's I mean, the thing. It depends on who it is. No, you know what? If, if you meet people in, you know, if you're in a social environment, right. if you're in a club, you're in a bar, um, Things like that can happen where 
You know, people are in those places for the express purpose of meeting other people unless they're there on a date. Right. So they want to meet people and theoretically are open to it. And that's, that's a good environment to introduce yourself. You know, I completely agree with you Happens all the that. time. But I, I really think that right now, um, I think we're, we happen to be living in a time where uh, if, a woman, if I was Our single... Our guards are up. Yeah, I think women... women their guards are up, but I also think guys need to have their guards up too because things can be interpreted very badly. Right. Like you said earlier, that if you had gone into that woman who's from Pasadena, Texas, um, you know, and given and consoled her, it might be a different scenario today, even though there was no ill will toward it or no, no, you know, bad. Yeah. No, you know, back then, back then you were allowed to demonstrate compassion. Right. Um, in ways that today in, a bus- in the business environment yeah. would not be acceptable. Right. Um, I think that what happened that night, um, I think it was, you ended up, I think it was good for her. She had someone to talk to who was a little bit older. You know, she trusted me. I was a, a company executive. She didn't know me very well. Uh, she didn't know me at all, actually. I sat in this big corner office, and it was a, I ran the creative department. She wasn't in that department. Nice um, all she knew was that I was a big company executive who cared. And in the advertising business in that era, you were allowed to demonstrate caring. Now, I think caring is really important. I think people who show that they care about other people do better than people who don't care. Mm-hmm. But I think in this day and age, you just have to be thoughtful about how you meet somebody. I think there are environments where people are up to meet people. That doesn't mean you're going to you know, score 100%. That doesn't mean somebody's going to go, oh, you're the, you, I've been waiting for you all my life. You're the, you're the guy on the, the, the white horse and you're the Prince Charming I've waited for. You know, but if, you know, if the rejection is automatic, just go away. You know, well, you know, who knows why? You'll never know why. And I would just erase it. You yeah, know, I agree. And most likely for it. Peter, he is doing more. They're called cold approaches, like going up to somebody completely random on the street when they're in an environment where they're not open to meeting people. And most likely those rejections are coming from him doing things like that over and over again. And, uh, because, also during yeah. during the day, people's priorities might be... it's. The, might be the weekday they're working, their mind is set on something else. Even if they're in a coffee shop, they might be working alone in a coffee shop, you know, for for a reason. It's the daytime. They're, you know, not everyone's just hanging around on a weekday and wanting to be approached. Their well, mind is elsewhere, right, so that could contribute to the rejection. Approached. So many guys, they, they, they start off the conversation with, like, their best opener, and then they expect <laughs> the woman to continue the conversation as if, like, oh, great, you've, you've introduced yourself to me. Now I can talk your ear off. Right. It's not like that. When you, as Bruce was saying, and Kristen, you're saying it too, women's guards are up right now. Everybody has their guard up right now, especially when being introduced or being approached by random strangers that they've never seen before. So you are going to have to work a little bit harder through either storytelling or some other way that you can finesse your conversation to express more about who you are as a person in order for them to drop that guard. Going to places that are more conducive um, and more open for people to socially interact and you know that you're going to that place for that reason, you're going to have a better chance of people being more open to you and giving you more time to to finesse your approach. The best way I know to actually interact with a totally strange person on a street, Yeah, get a dog. Oh my God. Or a baby. I wish I didn't have a dog because now everyone just talks to me. I'm like, well, nah, no, this is, he does not have a sign that says talk to my owner, but, but, but he does. And it's an invisible one. And it's a great thing to do. Yeah. And actually my brother ended up keeping a dog that I found on the street and it's this adorable little dog. It's like a chick magnet dog. And it, he didn't get, you know, he kept it, but not for that reason. But he was like, oh my God, now girls are like, or not yeah. girls, but people are talking to me more. And now he actually has a girlfriend. And I, it, yeah, and it's probably Good. obviously not because of the dog, but I think dog. it contributes to the ease of the relationship. You know, and plus it gives him more opportunities to go out and interact with people and be in conversation and see that he can do it. So right. that when he is by himself, it might be easier for him to start that conversation. But also, you know, I walk my dog every morning, and um, uh, I have bad knees, and I live in the hills, oh, so wow. I really can't walk her up and in, in, up near where I live. So I go down to the flats. <laughs> and, uh, and I walk. where the common people live well no, not so common <laughs> studio city not so common and but i walk along and invariably a woman number one even women that don't have dogs 
will stop because women like, and I have a very good looking dog, very pretty dog. So women will stop and will chat. You know, or, you have a Trump cadence, yeah. by the way. I have a pretty dog. He's a very pretty dog. Trump does that. And I know you're, I'm not saying you are Trump, ah! but, and I'm, you know, but it's, he throws in detail and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. He throws in positive detail. So I'm walking, you know, Trump would say that, you know, I've got a dog. I'm, you know, I walk the on the street. Dog. It's the best dog. It's a good looking dog. Yeah, but it's it, NLP. It's neurolinguistics programming. Right. But it's you're, you're doing it naturally, but it is a way to show, um, confidence or give more detail or something. But I want to point, I did want to point that out because by doing that, you throw in things to make people feel like more confident in what you're talking about yeah. or something. Well, I know this, that if, if I was a single guy, I could meet a lot of very nice, attractive women who would be suitable from an age standpoint just by walking my dog. Yeah, totally. Um, and I would never have to you say a word business, other you. than mm-hmm. walking past and say hello. I, I like to say hello to people. I think some people say hello back, some don't. But with the dog, people like the dog and what kind of dog is that? And, and you know, chat a little bit. If they have a dog, the dogs are sniffing each other and, you know, look what that leads to. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> it is a really good place. And, and I think if, and it's so cliche, but it works and it's like, if you do have a dog and you go to a dog park, people go there knowing they'll probably ha- end up having a conversation with someone. Yeah. So that's a place you can approach yeah. easily. Yeah, Peter, I think these are great recommendations. Overall, what we're saying is like ditch the cold approaches and don't start off with approaching people at random places. Go to places that are meant for interaction. Go to singles mixers or places where people are, are open to being approached for the purpose of potentially dating or get a dog. Or, or don't get a dog, but go to the dog park. Then you're the weirdo. Because the no, dog. no, then all you have to do is say, I, I want to get a dog and I'm scouting for what the kind of dog I want. It's a great yeah, excuse. Yeah, that that's a really but good you excuse. Can, you you wouldn't you know, find that weird? Mm, no. No. I mean, if he was just watching two dogs humping, maybe, but like. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> yeah. That would be very weird. <laughs> I would find that interesting. Okay. Very good suggestions. Bruce, thank you so much for being back on the show. I wanted to find an excuse to see you, so I'm glad that this was was available for it. But tell people how they can find out more about you. Is there a book about you? I'm sure there is. (laughs) Um, Well, there's a book that I wrote. Oh, yeah. What's the book you wrote? I wrote a book which has nothing to do... How to get things for free. It's amazing. No, it's called called How to Complain for Fun and Profit. Yeah. It's available at Amazon. I remember that. And some bookstores. so much shit for free. Yeah, it's it's a real good book about how to write complaint letters and get something back. Um... You can learn more about me at my website. Just Google Bruce Silverman advertising. There's another Bruce Silverman who's a lawyer. That one isn't me. Oh, interesting. And there's one who's a That's doctor. That's like a snapshot of your That's not me. And there's a been. veteran. That's not me. But the Bruce Silverman from advertising is okay. me. And, uh, you know, my website speaks well of me because okay. I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, Kristen, anything that you want to promote for yourself? Just a reminder that you guys can get help. Uh, with openers and banter and profile uh, advice, dating profile advice, if you hit me up on instantgo.com slash Kristen Carney, people are doing it. At first it was like kind of slow and I'm like, eh, I don't really know how I feel about this. Now pe- now a decent amount of people are writing and that's it's good. actually kind of fun. Okay, that's good. So if you see it, like, so a good thing to do if you see a picture of a girl on Bumble and you don't know, well, she, you can't open with her. If you see a picture of a girl on a site and you want to approach her and you don't know what to say, send me her profile and a screenshot and I will send you back like four or five different openers you can I use. I love that. Yeah. Perfect. You guys are awesome. Thank you for listening to our show. New episodes of the Ask Women podcast come out every Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Please don't be a loser and download individual episodes. Go and subscribe to our show um, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye.